The second question that we'd like to address inevitably relates to the first, but in terms of its consequences. Christians see the eating of the tree of knowing good and evil as the fall of man and a breaking point between God and us. Is this also the Jewish perspective? What changed in us and our relationship with God as a result of this sin and its punishment? Because, of course, inevitably, this question, these questions, force us to consider in much greater depth what happened as a result of this transformation in the human condition. Of course, here, too, we need to turn to the words of the Bible, and in particular, what we read in Genesis chapter 3, after man and woman have eaten of the tree of knowing good and evil. As everyone knows, there is crime and there is punishment. And what follows, beginning with verse 14, is what God says to each of the three accomplices in the crime. There are three, of course. There is the snake, there is the woman, and there is the man in that order. And it's important for us to stress, only one of these three is cursed. Only with respect to the snake. God says in verse 14, because you did this, you are cursed from all animals and all the beasts of the field. You will go on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I feel compelled to repeat a thought that I shared with you some months ago with respect to this verse, because here especially it's very relevant. What's the curse? The snake in the Garden of Eden. What its connection with biological snakes that we know today is a different issue. This snake is described as being condemned to go on its belly and eating dust all the days of its life. Whereupon, inevitably, we would raise the question, if you're going on your belly, what could possibly be more plentiful than dust? That's a curse? It would be a curse if the snake were given kilometer-high legs and forced to subsist from dust. How is it going to get to the dust? Kilometer high, how much dust is there? On the ground? I don't know about the ground by you, but here we have abundant dust. So, what's the curse? And of course, inevitably, the answer to the question hinges upon defining what is good and what is bad. We read in Psalms 73, last verse, this is a verse to which we have had occasion to return on so many opportunities over the course of our study. Asaf gives us a very clear definition of what the good is so far as he's concerned. In, again, Psalm 73, verse 28, for me, closeness to God is the good. How do we attain that closeness to God? Well, certainly a crucial element of that is because we call upon Him. We call upon our Father. And while for human beings that's obvious, it emerges from what we read in particular in Psalm 104, verse 21, that this applies not only to human beings. The young lions roar for prey and ask of God their food in a manner that certainly eludes my understanding. 
maybe eludes any human being's understanding. When the lion roars for prey, it connects to God. Because we have needs, needs that are unfulfilled, we always turn to God. Everyone has needs. And specifically because of those needs, we have that greatest good, as expressed in Psalm 73, verse 28, for me, closeness to God is the good. Everyone has needs. Everything has needs. Except, except the snake in the Garden of Eden. It has no needs. You'll be on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. You will never lack anything. You'll have everything you need. Everything that is, except the one thing that matters. You will never have anything to do with me. Take your needs. Take your food. Take your sustenance, says God to the snake, and get out of here. That is indeed a curse. That is the ultimate curse. Because it severs the snake from the only thing that matters, that closeness to God. That, again, pertains to the only accomplice that is cursed here. What happens to the woman and the man in the successive verses? In verse 16, to the woman, God said, I will multiply your anguish and your pregnancies. You will give birth in pain and be subordinate to your husband. And to the man, God said, the earth is accursed because of you. Note, the earth is accursed. You're not accursed. The earth is accursed before, because of you. And using the self-same root that pertained to the anguish of the woman in giving birth, you will eat of the earth in anguish all the days of your life. And you will sprout thorns and briars and eat the grass of the field. You will eat bread through the sweat of your faces until you return to the earth whence you came. These are stern words. But is it a severing of a relationship? No. It's what we might call in modern language, tough love. Because in effect, what is God saying to the woman and then to the man? You chose to become creative beings. You chose to leave that perceptive realm behind and enter the world of creativity. Okay, you're going to get exactly what you asked for. But don't think that being creative is going to be an easy ride. The ultimate act of creativity, as personified by the woman, is creating another human being. You will create, but you will create in anguish. You will give birth in pain. And for the man, the ultimate creative act is taming a recalcitrant world to be able to produce something of value. On the most basic plane, to produce food. Yeah, well, that's also going to be painful. Creating is fraught with anguish. So appreciate. Yes, you will be endowed now with the wherewithal to create. You will get exactly what you asked for. We should always watch out what we ask for. You ask to be creative, you will have to deal with the consequences and bear the brunt 
of what creativity imposes upon you. Is this punishment? Yes. Perhaps most critically, it is an assessment and evaluation of your reality. Because when all is said and done, what is really punishment? Punishment is an action and its consequences. These are the consequences. This is what you have done. Face up to it. Recognize these are the consequences of your actions. But again, is it a curse? The snake, it's a curse. Take what you need and get out of here. To the man and the woman, there's no curse. The earth is accursed in the sense that the earth will not deliver its bounty easily to you. Because you're going to have to deal with the consequences of becoming creative. But you're not cursed. And just consider in this vein, perhaps most dramatically, remember the most tangible, immediate transformation that took place in the man and woman as a result of eating of the tree of knowing good and evil was beforehand they were naked and unashamed. They eat of the tree of knowing good and evil and they are ashamed. They know they're naked and they strive to cover their nakedness. You might think that if that transformation was just evil, the result of sin, then God might say, go around naked. Or even specifically to withhold from them the opportunity to cover their nakedness in order to exacerbate their sense of shame. And what in fact do we read immediately after the punishment? The very next stage in the story in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, God the Lord made man and woman raiments of skin and clothed them. And I can't help but add here that in our tradition we have a saying that the entire Torah from beginning to end is acts of kindness. The Torah begins with an act of kindness. Because, you know, one of the archetypal acts of kindness is clothing the naked. And here we see God clothed the naked. The Torah also ends with an act of kindness because at the very end of the Torah, God buries Moses. And of course, burying the dead is also an act of kindness. I can't help but add, I realize this is an add-on, an add-on, but uh, there is an obvious connection between these two acts of kindness, clothing the naked and bearing the dead. What both of them signify is respect for human honor and dignity. To be naked, bereft of clothing. And for that matter, for a dead body to go unburied is an affront to human dignity. God protects human dignity. God clothed Adam and Eve. That's not the sort of conduct you would expect if Adam and Eve were now accursed. They're not accursed. Rather, the relationship with God continues. It's only with the snake, after all, that the relationship was severed. It's a different kind of relationship. But on the contrary, that doesn't mean that the goal has changed. The goal is still to draw ourselves close to God. The goal essentially is to make ourselves and the world more godly. Just for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, making themselves more godly 
was specifically by being perceptive and not being creative. By appreciating that in the Garden of Eden, one exists in a realm of quiescence. In our world, on the contrary, you are forbidden to be quiescent. You need to do. That's your summons. And indeed, God gives you a whole set of mandates and guidelines for how to harness your creativity in order to create something good. And to attempt to ignore the fact that we are creative beings isn't some return to the Garden of Eden. It's simply abdicating our responsibilities in this world. It would be the same as if we were to decide that we will strip off our clothes and go around naked in this world. It wouldn't bring us back to the Garden of Eden. No. This is our nature in this world. We are creative beings. We are endowed, then, with a nature that is resonant with our role in this world, which is to create. And it is by creating that we make ourselves and the world more godly, so long as we employ that power of creativity for good. That essentially is what changed. And as a result, then, we still have a relationship with God. And we still have the same goal to return to God. What changes the challenges? It's important for us to appreciate that what we certainly concede with respect to this transformation is we aren't where we were in the Garden of Eden. And indeed, in this vein, we can cite the words of Ecclesiastes, the end of chapter 7, verse 29 in Ecclesiastes, the Lord made man upright, but they sought many contrivances. And yes, that obviously elicits from us a kind of um, groan of sorrow. There was that idyllic realm of being upright without the contrivances. As expressed in game isn't over. It's a different game. Again, the goal is still God and godliness. The means through which we pursue that goal inevitably are modified by the transformation that takes place in man. So we are changed but we're not lost. And the relationship with God, not severed. And the opportunity to be godly is still with us. Just, of course, inevitably we face the consequences of pursuing that course specifically through the realities of this world, not paradise. We're not there. And we're not even trying to get there. Rather, we're here in this world and doing our utmost to make this world 
the best it can possibly be. God bless you.